Welcome back. We're going to continue our discussion of Chapter 11, Managing Transaction Exposure, picking up where we left off in a section called Limitation of Hedging and Uncertain Payment. You know, there's no such thing as a perfect hedge anyway. I say here perfect hedges are found only in textbooks and sales brochures. You're probably not going to have an exact match between, for instance, the due date of a payable and the date of uh, expiration or the date of settlement. Uh, of a futures contract or an options contract if you're dealing with forward um, uh, contracts because those are individually negotiated and can be tailored to a specific situation you can certainly uh, have those coincide more closely with the uh, specific dates of a payable uh, is due or receivable and amount is going to be is going to be collected uh, however, you know, and one of the things I haven't mentioned is that forward contracts typically appeal more to larger institutions um, because they are more cost effective that way. Smaller institutions, rather than incur the costs of uh, negotiating forward contracts, are typically going to be able to uh, make better use of futures and options, uh, you know, those publicly traded securities. But anyway, the notion here is the international transactions involve, involving an uncertain amount of foreign currency will uh, often result in a company overhedging, that is, in committing to purchasing more rather than less. It's like overbuying insurance in some sense, and that can leave you, leave you with an excess of the foreign currency. Um, and so um, anyway, that can be a problem. Of course, you could underhedge as well. But uh, the issue brought forth in your textbook here is that of overhedging. The multinational can lessen potential costs by hedging the known or the more certain, or I think in your uh, notes I may say minimum. Uh, hedge that minimum amount is that amount that you know you're more confident is, is, is going to have to, you're going to have to have, and any excess or contingent amount, uh, do that with options. Remember those options give you the flexibility of uh, not having to exercise them if it's not to not to your advantage. Leading and lagging means adjusting the timing of payments or disbursements to reflect expectations about the future currency movements. Uh, what we could do is accelerate payment of foreign currency payables when we expect the foreign currency to appreciate relative to the, the currency that we're uh, our own home currency. For example, your firm has to pay uh, 30,000 British pounds in 30 days. If the spot rate is a dollar and a quarter today, and the forward rate is a dollar 30, well, that payment would cost you $37,500 today. But if you wait 30 days, and in fact that uh, forward rate you know, is the spot rate, uh, remember the forward rate is, uh, let's say today's best estimate of what the future spot rate is going to be. So if in fact that dollar 30 is the spot rate, that so those British pounds would cost you $39,000 at that point. And so you could engage in a hedge, but you simply may be in a position to, to go ahead and pay early. And as we've seen, that that has a cost to it. That is, if you've got, uh, you know, $38,000, $40,000 just sitting around doing nothing with no prospects for its use, then maybe it has no opportunity cost. But for the most part, we would imagine most companies do see that their their currency, their cash, uh, sitting around does in fact have a cost to it. So it's something to consider. Uh, anyway, accelerate payment of payables when you expect the foreign currency to appreciate. Delay payment of the foreign currency payables when you expect the foreign currency to depreciate relative to your own. What about receivables? Well, the multinational has less control over collection uh, of receivables. You probably wouldn't have much success if you explain to your your customer that you'd like to get paid early because it's going to be to your advantage in terms of exchange rates. Just realize if it's to your advantage to, to for them to collect or uh, to collect from them early, it's probably to their disadvantage. <laughs> uh, they would be better off uh, taking the same position you do. That is, uh, you want to get it early, they want to pay late. So under under the same circumstances. Cross-hedging, hedging by using a currency that serves as a proxy for the currency in which the multinational company is exposed. This is another reason that you may uh, never find the perfect hedge, or the mismatch in terms of maybe the amounts that you, uh, you know, for instance, you, you don't find futures or options contracts that exactly, you know, uh, line up with the amount of, of money that you are trying to hedge or 
it may be in this case, well, I mentioned a time frame. You know, you just don't have those uh, maturity dates or settlement dates on those contracts that coincide exactly with the date that you're going to receive or pay foreign currency. Well, here's another one. You may find that uh, there's not a foreign currency, or at least that there's um, there aren't sufficient alternatives in a particular currency that in which you're going to receive payment or you're going to make a payment. For example, you may want to hedge a New Zealand dollar receivable, but find that there are a few choices of derivatives. However, there are alternatives, hedging with Australian dollars. Uh, Australian dollars are very widely traded uh, currency. Um, and the New Zealand dollar and Australian dollar tend to move closely together. So you can use Australian dollars as a proxy. It's not uh, going to be exact, but it's going to be, let's say, better than anything else. In currency diversification, this is kind of an interesting one to me, reducing exposure by diversifying business among numerous countries, assuming movements of those currencies are not highly correlated. Certainly, companies do tend to want to diversify to seek out opportunities elsewhere, but I don't know that they're ever motivated by the uh, desire to diversify currencies. They're interested in diversifying their markets and accessing new markets. But uh, anyway, it's something to think about. But uh, this is the points made here is that if, in fact, these foreign currencies are highly correlated with other currencies in which you're already uh, trading, then it's not going to be advantageous. You're not going to obtain any diversification um, by uh, branching out in, in, uh, in this way. Okay, the real, uh, let's say, main part of this video is to walk through a couple of sample problems, ones fit similar to those that you um, have assigned uh, for this chapter. And so without further ado, there are two types. One of those has to do with what's called the uh, calculating the real cost of hedging. Uh, they even have a formula in the book that's, uh, I think they use RCH. It's not a, a very uh, common, I guess, abbreviation that I'm familiar with, but Anyway, let's look at a sample problem. This is the hedging of future uh, foreign currency payments or receipts. Uh, provides protection, but the firm may be better off without hedging. Hedging provides price insurance, and that's the way to look at hedging. You, you um, hedge in order to avoid a worse outcome should the exchange rate move the wrong way, move against you. And you just have to see that if, if, for instance, the exchange rate moves in the opposite direction, you can't, it doesn't pay really to kick yourself. You learn from that, you know, to help you, to help better inform your future. But you don't uh, pay your car insurance and say, and then later on when you don't have an accident, say, oh man, I shouldn't have paid that. Um, assume that Bullard Company negotiated a forward contract to purchase 500,000 euros in 60 days, which is needed to pay a Spanish manufacturer. The 60-day forward rate was $1.10 per euro. At the time the forward contract was due for settlement, that is 60 days later, the euro was trading at $1.13. What was the real cost of hedging the payables for Bullard Company? Well, notice here the answer is figured as taking the U.S. dollars that we had to pay with the hedge and what we would have had to pay if we if we didn't hedge. That is, if we simply had to buy those 500,000 euros at the spot rate at the time that the payable was due. Well, you can see here, with the hedge, we locked in that price of $1.10 per euro, and so we paid $550,000. I say we, I'm trying to identify with Bullard Company here. Um, anyway, $550,000. If we hadn't hedged, then we would have to buy those euros at the spot rate of $1.13 at that time, and that would have cost $565,000. So notice here, the real cost of hedging, RCH, is the US, the cost of this purchase essentially with the hedge, what it cost us in dollars, minus the cost um, if we had not hedged, the 565,000. And so that's a negative $15,000, but this is a cost. And so a reduction in cost um, between these two alternatives is a good thing. The cost of this purchase was reduced $15,000 as a result of the hedge. Now, what if instead of the euro appreciating, it weakened such that the spot rate at settlement was a dollar eight? Well, here it, we had uh, already locked in through the uh, forward contract a price of a dollar ten, so that's five fifty. But of course, if in fact the rate was dollar uh, eight at that time, 
and we purchased those 500,000 euros at that price, it would have cost us only 540. So the real cost of the hedge in this case was $10,000. That is that hedging actually cost us money. Uh, we were worse off in, by $10,000, at least when all was said and done, as a result of, of, the, of hedging. The second type of problem involves a hedging with, well, here's a comparison of hedges, money market and uh, forward hedging. Forward by, is by far easier, but let's look at this problem and see what, we've, what information we've got. Uh, Ravco, a U.S. company, will need 8 million Brazilian reals in 180 days. It wishes to hedge this payables position. So notice here we've got the 180-day U.S. interest rate, 5.2%. By the way, this is actually an annual rate. It's just, uh, in this case, um, it's for, uh, let's say, a period of, five, of, of uh, 180 days, but it's actually an annual rate. That's almost always the case. We talk about interest rates in annual terms. The Brazilian interest rate, 6.2%. 180 day forward rate of the real, 0.188 or 18, um, well, 0.188 dollars per real. Spot rate, as of this time, 19 cents. Now, you know, we've done problems like this before. You remember maybe the US, uh, the US dollar, New Zealand dollar uh, example that we went through. And you might recall from some of those other problems that we had two sets of rates for each of these countries here. We had a lending rate and a borrowing rate. Well, here, just imagine these rates are relevant to this particular setting here. So um, let's think about what's going to happen. We want to lock in, in this case, a, a purchase price in dollars. And so this forward, let's go ahead and get the forward uh, uh, hedge out of the way because it's the easiest one and we'll have to come back to some of these um, uh, these rates here to, to make some a sense of them. Well, there's the same information. Let's look, uh, if the firm uses the forward hedge, it will basically lock in this rate here by buying Brazilian reals and it will pay a million four five hundred to four thousand dollars in 180 days. That is, it locks that in, and when the time comes, it will um, uh, it'll cost it a million five hundred four thousand uh, U.S. dollars for those eight million Brazilian reals. So we have a, a pretty easy way to determine the the cost in dollars of this uh, forward hedge. Now, well, I say that's not the cost of the hedge. It's really the amount that we have to pay under that particular forward market hedge. Now, of course, the money market hedge is a lot more involved, so let's walk through this and spend a little bit of time. By the way, I'm going to jump ahead and show you something here. Here are the steps in a money market hedge. And it doesn't matter here whether, um, well, it doesn't matter whether you expect the, uh, let's say, the home currency or the, um, or the uh, foreign currency to appreciate or depreciate. These, these steps here are really uh, <clears throat> the same, um, regardless of uh, whether you expect the foreign currency to appreciate or depreciate. Because notice what we're doing. We will today, a money market hedge, borrow the currency expected to depreciate, convert that to the currency expected to appreciate, then invest those funds, that is this foreign currency. We're gonna invest those funds and then, in this case, in 180 days, that is when the, uh, the hedge, we're ready to lift the hedge, we're going to close that investment account, this one right here. And this, keep in mind, this will be, you know, from our perspective here, in the foreign currency, in Brazilian reals. And then we'll use the proceeds to pay the amount that's due. Um, okay, now let's go back and walk through these steps. Because what's going to happen here, we've actually got to figure how much to borrow. You might remember that first swing we took at that U.S. dollar, New Zealand dollar example. You may want to go back and look at that. You might recall that we needed to pay 40 million New Zealand dollars in 30 days, 60 days, something like that. And so we went ahead and borrowed uh, 20 million U.S. dollars and converted those at the spot rate. But then we invested the 40 million uh, New Zealand dollars, but we ended up with more New Zealand dollars than we needed. And so we ended up paying the bill, the 40 million uh, New Zealand dollar bill, and then we converted 
the, uh, let's say, the earnings on that investment back. And at the end of that section, we said, you know what? We didn't need to have that many. We didn't need, we had more New Zealand dollars than we needed. So uh, how many New Zealand dollars would we actually need, you know, at, uh, you know, at the beginning of the investment to end up with 40 million? And then we said, you know what? Uh, since we didn't need as many, uh, we didn't need 40 million New Zealand dollars at time zero, we didn't, need to, we didn't need to borrow as many U.S. dollars as we did. <clears throat> so these are the steps we would follow. But as you'll see here, we've got to sort of start uh, at the end. Uh, Stephen Covey, I think, is one of those people that said, begin with the end in mind. Well, let's uh, kind of look forward a bit and say, you know what? We're going to need 8 million Brazilian reals in 180 days. That's six months. But we don't need to invest 8 million Brazilian reals today to end up with 8 million. We only need the present value of that 8 million. And as it turns out, that's 7,759,456 Brazilian reals that we need today. That is the start of this 180-day uh, period. And so, <clears throat> as you can see here, uh, this is the present value of 8 million discounted at 6.2% for 180 days. Essentially, this is your future value. Your I is 6.2%, and that's an annual rate, and your N is 0.5. And the way I actually do that, I think in terms of periods, and so this is a future value. I actually figured my periodic rate of return is 3.1%, and then this uh, semi-annual period was one. In other words, I define this problem in semi-annual terms, but you know you can do it. Uh, there's a couple of different ways to approach this one, but what you're doing is treating this as a future value and then discounting at this rate for this period of time to arrive at this amount. So that's the Brazilian reals you need. You can always double check yourself, by the way. Use this as the present value. <clears throat> I've lost my cursor. Uh, use this as the present value. You know this is your interest rate. You know, so invest this amount at this rate for this number of periods. And again, uh, you could do this. There's a PV. There's your I. And then your, because that's an annual rate, that is, you define this problem in annual terms, then your period is 0.5. It's half a year. And you're going to find this is your future value. So you can double check just to make sure you're, you're on track here. Work the problem in reverse. So that's how many Brazilian reals we need today. Okay, and if in fact we can uh, buy Brazilian reals at 19 cents each, the spot rate, that means we need a million four seventy four two hundred ninety seven U.S. dollars to do that. Okay, well, that means we're going to have to borrow today million four seventy four two ninety seven. Okay, we're going to then convert that those dollars to reals this many of them, invest them so that in 180 days we end up with the 8 million that we need, no more, no less. Well, now, if this amount's borrowed today, Ravco will need a million five twelve six twenty nine to repay that loan in 180 days. That's the principal of one million seven four seventy four two ninety seven, and interest of this amount. There's the calculation of the amount that actually should be. Let me see, I'm going to fix this so you can see me do it. That means that is million copy. Put that guy right in there. I'm not sure how that, well, I can imagine many ways that could have happened. <laughs> but the interest is principal times uh, rate times time. Okay? So we're actually figuring this, well, that's the, there's the interest right there. Let me get rid of that. I was figuring the future, the total amount. But there's the interest, principal times rate times time. There's the rate up there. And you know what I mentioned earlier? So there's the amount of, uh, of interest that results from this. And that's a different amount. And I think actually comes from your, I'm going to calculate that. I would redo this, but it's about the third time I got started on this and then uh, realized I'd left a hole someplace. So you're going to get to uh, just see me work it. Now, what I'm trying to do here is just confirm that 38,332. 1474, isn't this healthy for you to see this, times point 
0 0.052, uh, basically times 0 0.5, 180. 38, 332. There you go. Okay. So, sure enough, 38. I don't know what it was. I didn't intend to leave that at all. There we go. So this principle times rate times time gives us that interest amount. So that plus that is the million five twelve. So that's the overall dollar cost at you know at the end of 180 days uh, for this money market hedge. Okay, we don't have anything left over in terms of Brazilian reals to to bring back, that is to reconvert. Uh, so this is everything. So this real cost of hedging basically is simply comparing, well. Not the real cost of hedging. Sorry, <laughs> the uh, comparing the the uh, results of these hedges, we know what we paid out in dollars uh, in 180 days for the forward hedge, and now we know what we'd have to pay in 180 days for the money market hedge. So the company should use uh, that forward hedge. Oops, I guess I forgot to go back to. There we go. That's that's better. Um, so again, we're talking about uh, trying to make it a payable here, a payment. Uh, so we want to uh, choose the route that's cheapest, that's less costly, and that would be the money market hedge. It's, it's easier here, but that's certainly not a concern to you and me, is it? So again, just to re review, there's the, the steps, there's the process. So whether you're dealing with... Um, um, Appreciation or depreciation uh, in a money market hedge. Here, here's the way to go. Here are the steps. And there's the summary. I hope these uh, uh, certainly that these reviewing these problems have helped you because I know that you've got a couple of problems sim very similar to this one. You've got one similar to this guy over here, real cost of hedging. And I think you've got some that are more straightforward, more broad concepts types of questions. So as always, let me know how I can help you. If there's any holes or some obvious problems that you've spotted here, uh, almost every video I watch it later on and I say, man, I wish I'd, I, didn't, I didn't say that correctly or, or you know, I, I uh, just got distracted on something. Uh, so please let me know if there are any questions that you have. God bless.